and to tonight's speaker. I had the um, really enjoyable uh, opportunity to have dinner uh, with Terence prior to this uh, lecture. And I'm, I'm a little sorry to say that uh, I finished my dinner before he finished his because I was asking questions and he was telling me uh, in fulsome detail about how he came to be in the position he is tonight giving this lecture on this topic. And it was fascinating. I might find people interested in it anyway, but I found his, his experiences out of this world. And hence, I can give a personal recommendation because he said a lot of what he was telling me over the restaurant table he will be covering in his talk. So I don't want to stand between you and your speaker anymore. Except to say one thing, this is your first visit to the SSPR, mm -hmm. and it's your first visit to Glasgow. My f the first visit for many, many years. Okay. He will maybe have forgotten what Glasgow Welcome can be like. Because down in the SSPR it's all this kind of stuff. <coughs> Let him know we appreciate the fact he's come from deep south. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And I too did enjoy the dinner. <laughs> um, and I'd like to thank the SSPR for inviting me up here to speak with you. And I always jump at the opportunity at the invitation to speak on this subject because it's become um, a, a bit of a, a, a quest for me to, to help educate people um, about telepathic hypnosis and about spirit possession. So I thank all of you for attending to listen to what I have to say this evening. Now, I am actually a spirit release practitioner. What that means is that it is my job to help people relieve themselves of the uncomfortable, very often distressing experience of being affected by discarnate spirit entities. So that's my job as a spirit release practitioner. It is my quest, even, I'm retired now, so I don't get much opportunity to work. I have to, I'm full-time carer for my aged mother who has Alzheimer's, so I can't get out of the house very often. <clears throat> but when I do, I try to put myself in positions where I can educate, primarily, the psychiatric profession. Because a lot of um, what are considered to be mental illnesses are the result of spirit interference. So I'm looking for uh, a medical establishment, a psychiatric institution, and this is why I'm recording this, because I'm going to send a copy of this to all of you, um, inviting them to investigate this phenomenon more seriously than they do, because they tend to reject it and not consider the hypothesis that spirits to influence people now I'm going to put, I'm going to so that's my objective to find just one institution in, in the UK that will take this seriously and um, and investigate it and test it now I'm going to begin my presentation by making a statement that, that challenges <coughs> our most commonly held beliefs <coughs> Telepathic hypnosis is the principal means by which discarnate entities interfere with the thoughts, feelings, and behavior of the living. When we talk about spirit possession, I'm not suggesting that spirits actually take possession of the body and control it, which is something that's depicted in horror films, something that is uh, witnessed or, or interpreted perhaps by anthropologists when they see shaman and uh, people practicing traditional religious rituals in their ethnic groups around the world. What I'm proposing is that the discarnate entity delivers suggestions to the mind <coughs> of the affected in much the same way that a stage hypnotist does. In fact, the stage hypnotist is, gives an excellent example of how 
a suggestion takes possession of a person. So that statement challenges our deeply held beliefs. So what are those deeply held beliefs? We are taught to believe by society in general. We are taught to believe what we believe by science. We're educated at school and we're certainly not taught <coughs> this. We are taught that we are um, material beings living an earthly life uh, as an animal, which is true, and I'm not arguing against that at all. But you have this dispute between scientific materialism, which is purely mechanistic and in the three-dimensional box, and that's challenged by religious beliefs. And, and this could fall into that category of religious belief. So what we come to believe is what we are, what it's suggested to us by the culture that we live in to believe. Now I never believed in such things as spirits or ghosts or gold or any of that stuff at all until I began to have mystical experiences. And when I did, I recognised the need for me as an autonomous human being to be in control of my own destiny. How is it possible for someone else's ideas to influence me when I have the God-given gift of free will? It challenges the core self to think that we can be influenced and controlled by another person. It's anathema, it's a no. So this, this is another aspect that prevents us from believing in the first statement. But then we come to the personal experience. <laughs> These experiences that I was explaining to Nick over dinner when he asked me how I got into this business and I, I'm going to convey to you this evening some of those experiences. So I've learned not through being taught, I've learned not through studying psychology at university, I've learned through the practical experience and engaging one-to-one -one with spirit entities in dialogue. <coughs> so what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you two things this evening. I'm going to show you a model to illustrate how perspectives are predetermined by the, what I call the continuum of vulnerability. Some people can integrate consciously with spirits, Others can't. And the other thing I want to talk about, the second part of the lecture, is the importance of telepathic hypnosis and why it's been abandoned by psychology research. And then towards the end, if we have time, we'll have a look at a case study and some research proposals. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you <coughs> some case histories. I was working as a, a hypnotherapist, just an ordinary, run-of-the-mill, psychologically trained hypnotherapist for a, a doctor, for a GP. And he would send me his chronic cases. And I was dealing with cases primarily with diseases of the nervous system, like epilepsy, Parkinson's, dystonia, where using self-hypnosis, the patient can actually take control of these involuntary movements. It's quite useful. To, to, to have. But then I began to encounter cases <coughs> of an emotional nature that challenged everything I'd been taught about hypnosis and psychology. And these cases were so challenging, not just challenging to the theoretical frameworks that I was trying to work in, but they were physically threatening to me where patients wanted to kill me. Now I didn't know how to deal with this and nobody around me knew how to deal with it. So I had to stop working and go away and do some serious research. And it was in a bookshop <laughs> and the sales assistant said to me, I think you can help me. 
And I said, what makes you think that? She said, I've noticed the books you've been reading. And I said, well, what's the problem? She said, I have a compelling anger that I can't explain. <coughs> so she invited me to her house and one day <coughs> I'm sat there talking to an intelligent, educated, peaceful woman and the next minute someone is talking to me through her saying, I'm going to kill you and all the other white men. And I think it's getting really interesting. This reminded me of cases earlier that I did not know how to deal with. And here's another one. And my question was spontaneous. I said, well, who are you? Because I knew it wasn't the woman that was sat in front of me. And when I said, who are you? The voice went ballistic. How dare you question me? Who are you to ask me who I am? This was a powerful person whose authority was never, had never been questioned. How dare you ask me who I am? Said the voice. I didn't know how to deal with this, so I had to <coughs> gracefully find a way to end the session and withdraw. But I was being told that I had to find a resolution to this problem. So those of you who are spiritualists will understand what I mean when I say I was guided. And I was guided to a man, a psychiatrist called Dr. Alan Sanderson. Some of you may know him. He's been up here and spoken to you. This was 14 years ago I met Alan Sanderson. And he now is a close friend and colleague, and we work very closely together. And he explained one or two things to me. He said, you need to learn how to deal with this. Now, at the time, there was, uh, there was a couple in Kent who uh, were teaching this. They'd been to America. They'd been trained by a pioneer called uh, Dr. Irene Hickman. And, they'd, and she'd set up the Hickman Academy and they were teaching her methods in England. And I went along there, and the way it worked was that they, they taught us the techniques of how to engage with these entities. And having taught us, then they asked us to put it into practice. And the way it worked was that you, you put the name of someone on a piece of paper into the hat, and, and the names were taken out at random. And whoever's name you pulled out of the hat, that was the person that you would try to help. Using telepathic <coughs> hypnosis, using clairvoyance, using telepathy. So the person wasn't actually there, they were somewhere else. And quite by chance, and some would argue that it was a, a fortunate coincidence, but it's not a coincidence, this is synchronicity. This was meant to happen. The name I pulled out of the hat was the name of the, the woman in the bookshop. <laughs> and these very, very expert teachers took me through the process of engaging with the medicine chief who was possessing the woman in the bookshop and wanted to kill all the white men. And I became at one with him and went with him to the light where I saw with my own clear vision all those souls who perished in the North American Indian Wars. And I understood. And that was the beginning of my training. When the training was finished, I had a string of cases, they, they came knocking on the door. I didn't go looking for these, they just came my way. And I'm just going to very, very briefly give you uh, a few examples that I dealt with having been trained. The schoolgirl who couldn't walk, this was a, young, a teenage girl 
who progressively lost the use of her legs until she had to be taken to school in a wheelchair. And there was no medical explanation, there was nothing physically wrong with her. But she was referred to me and I went to the house and I saw her crawling from room to room on her elbows, dragging her legs behind her. And on investigation, and when I say investigation, I engaged the young girl I managed to get her into an altered state of consciousness where she could, and the technique is very simple really, you just say to the higher self, to the subliminal mind, as, as Frederick Myers would say, to the unconscious, there's a part of you that knows what's causing this problem, I want to speak to that part, take me there, one, two, three, and you're there. Tell me what's happening. She was in the back garden of her friend playing. She was a young child, six, seven, eight years old. And the uncle of her friend tried to molest her. And here we have an example that illustrates what I describe. I've written a book about this. It's called The Science of Spirit Possession. It's coming out in its second edition in about six months' time. But in that book, I write about this sympathetic resonance because emotions have an energetic frequency the frequency of anger is different from the frequency of fear it's like tuning in a radio station the frequency changes and there are discarnate entities that are attracted to different energy frequencies a person who goes through life with a negative attitude will attract negative entities on the same wavelength. You hear about people talking, oh, we were on the same wavelength, on the same frequency. This is sympathetic resonance. So the entity was got rid of and she could go back to school, she could walk again. The school teacher was an impulse to electric electrocute herself on investigation again using hypnosis it was revealed that there was um, in a previous life she'd been a healer in Scotland I don't know exactly where but some in the 15th century she was one of the wise women of the village who would heal people who course orthodox religion considered such people as witches, there was the, the witch hunts, um, and she was, um, she was hanged as a witch in a prison somewhere in Scotland. <coughs> Although she had a leaning towards healing, nursing, she avoided that and decided to become a teacher instead. But there was an entity attached to her whose job it was to prevent her working as a healer. And it was giving her obsessive thoughts about putting her fingers into live electric sockets. So that was a, a dark force entity, that was demonic. That had a specific job to do, and that was to encourage her to kill herself. Couldn't get her to commit suicide, but put, put, putting fingers in sockets. So that was dealt with in an appropriate way. Dark Samuel, here we have a, a woman in her late 30s, early 40s, had been traumatized as a child, had been vulnerable, placed into care, abused, all that nonsense, gone through life, getting it all sorted out, seeing psychotherapists and healers and uh, counselors, and she got her life on track. But there was still something nagging. She said, there's still something unresolved and I can't put my finger on it. So again, it's a very simple task to find out. Well, let's ask for the answer. She went beautifully into trance. <coughs> and we found Dark Samuel. Samuel was uh, an earthbound. He, he lived a life on earth. And he regarded this woman as his property and he controlled her life, wanted to control her life. 
So he was dealt with in an appropriate way. On that particular occasion, I think it was Gabriel that came to escort him off. And I can remember him saying, because I wanted some, usually when an earthbound is escorted to the light, someone comes from the light, someone, a loved one, a close relative. But there was no one who loved Samuel. <laughs> Nobody wanted him. So I said, oh, what do we do now then? And then there was this shining light came into the, into the arena. And I said to Samuel, Samuel suddenly became very frightened. I said, what's the matter, Samuel? What's going on? He said, it's Gabriel. I said, now what are you going to do? He said, well, I can't argue with him, can I? <laughs> so off he went. But the interesting thing about this case was that Dark Samuel had been with this, this client, this woman, for so long, she wanted to get rid of this like a stone in the shoe. But once he'd gone, she'd been, he'd been with her so long. She was in the kitchen making a cup of tea and she said, can you do me a favour? I said, what's that? She said, can you bring it back? <laughs> I said, you've got your fruit. Learn to, you know, use it. But so that is how this kind of entity can affect a person. That they actually lose their free will and get used to having, not having it. It's a dangerous business. Mm -hmm. On the back of these and other successful cases, I was, I was invited to go to America and work with some people in America and, and to be interviewed on American television about this. And while I was there, I met a man whose job it was to help rehabilitate convicted wife beaters and sex offenders. And they were appointed by the court to attend this rehabilitation course for a year. And he would counsel them and help them overcome their um, behavior. And we discovered, I'm not, it's a long story, I'm not gonna go into details, but we discovered several <coughs> entities attached to him as the therapist, he's picked them up. So healers can be affected. In fact, I wrote, I wrote an article about this that was published in a, in a journal online called um, Paranthropology. It's Paranormal Anthropology together, published by Bristol University. Uh, it's in the first edition. Um, it's in there if you'd like to read it. So we did some work on these um, convicted wife beaters and the facilitator went to his employers and said, look, look what we've discovered. We've got to do something with this. And they said, it certainly looks interesting. And we said to them, um, can we conduct a proper controlled trial mm -hmm. and document this? And they said, yes, providing it's monitored and managed by an established accredited scientific institution. I said, great. Terrific. That was in 2004. It's now 2014, <laughs> and I'm still looking for an institution to take it seriously. So that's why I'm talking to you and other audiences who are listening. So I'm looking for a mechanism as to how this works. And I discovered Frederick Myers, who said that. Now Frederick Myers is my hero because what he sang there in essence, is it doesn't matter what you believe. I'm not interested in what you believe. I'm not interested in rational argument. I don't care what the philosophers say. I'm not interested in theology or beliefs in God or any of that. I want proof. Show me the evidence. And he went out of his way to get it. And over the course of 20 years, from being a founder member of the SPR in London, 1882, till his death, 
He wrote over 10,000 pages of evidence. And most people don't even know the man existed. And he provided some of the most <coughs> important evidence on the subject of spirit possession. So this is the first <coughs> important concept, idea, model that I want to present to you to explain why some people believe in such things and others don't. Here we have what I call the dissociation hypnotizability continuum. It's my belief and my experience that we all have the ability to slip into an altered state of consciousness where we can access other realms of experience. Some people find it very easy, others find it quite difficult. I find it quite difficult. It's very difficult to get me into a, an altered state where I can experience such things. So I would put myself at the thin end of the wedge. The rational scientist that has a rash that needs a rational explanation for everything. As we move along the dissociation scale, it becomes easier to slip in and out of altered states of consciousness. We, can, we, we begin to recognize synchronicities for what they are. No, they're not unexplained coincidences. You develop a knowing. No, that's not a coincidence. That's something that happened through design, I'm not quite sure how, but these things are happening. As we move further along the continuum, they become more common, more easily acceptable, until right at the other end of the continuum, you have spiritualist mediums and people who virtually live in a spiritual world. Now, we have the positive and the negative. <coughs> The dissociation hypnotizability continuum has several dimensions to it. And there's a lot of research being done in psychology on susceptibility to somnambulism, altered states. Correspondingly, a lot of research has been done on what's known as the schizotypal personality, where researchers at Oxford University hypothesized that there's a continuum of mental health and mental illness. Mental health to mental illness. A schizotypal scale. And the further we move along that scale, the more prone the person is <coughs> to psychological disturbance. Borderline personality disorder, dissociation, psychosis, schizophrenia, at the far end of the continuum, schizophrenia. And this can also be correlated with a model of ego fragmentation. Uh, a psychologist called Scharfetter wrote about this, and he devised um, an ego fragmentation scale. I've tried to reproduce it, but it doesn't reproduce well. Besides, I need to write to him and get permission, and it's a difficult thing to do. But it's very simple. At this end of the scale, you've got the fully integrated human being, um, the cohesive individual. As you move along the continuum with the dissociation hypnotizability, you get increased fragmentation of the personality. It becomes fragmented into different facets of the personality. We all have different ego parts, different facets. We have a creative part, an angry part, an inconsiderate part. We all have a good side and a dark side. And careful study, careful introspection will reveal that these different aspects of the personality if you take the time to do it. As we move further along the continuum, the personality becomes more disjointed 
um, less stable until at the, out, at the far end of the continuum we've got schizophrenia where the person loses all sense of identity can't tell the difference between reality and, uh, and uh, fantasy and is all over the place <laughs> so if we use the dissociation hypnotizability continuum in relation to ego strength a robust sense of self sharp end of the wedge people who are in control cannot acknowledge any possibility that they can be influenced by a spirit world at all scientific rationalists the other end of the scale people who virtually live in a spiritual world the positive there's your shaman and your trance medium they can dissociate but they have a strong robust sense of self <coughs> but they can dissociate from the immediate surroundings and go into other realms <coughs> and they understand it they know it they can control it that's the positive the person with a fragmented ego who has no such knowledge and has a very very loose boundary around a sense of self that's your psychotic the further you move along the dissociation continuum the more you are vulnerable to spirit influence so the person who has knowledge and a strong sense of self becomes a medium the person who has no knowledge is vulnerable and has a fragmented ego becomes psycho psychotic and even more dangerous becomes possessed so you can become possessed by benign spirit as the trance medium does by by guides and such like the person who has no knowledge who has weakness becomes possessed by the demonic it's a very simple model and for me it explains an awful lot and there's a lot of research to back that up that i could cite for you This can also be represented by the normal distribution curve. Any of you who are familiar with scientific investigations and statistical analysis, uh, and the relationship between what is normal and what is not, will be familiar with that. <coughs> but for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it's another way of representing the, the wedge that I just showed you. On the extreme left are those people who are rational scientists, strong ego, no experience of the supernatural or the paranormal, and fail to understand how anyone else can be affected in such a way. On the other end of the scale, you've got those people who live in a spiritual world. The vast majority of the population are that big hump in the middle, who have some experiences, that remain unexplained some people report their experiences to the SPR SSPR most people don't I've had lots and lots of experiences that I've never reported so the principle of the continuum is what this is enables me to answer a question that I'm often asked and that is what percentage of people are influenced by spirit well my answer to the question is 100% we all are but the people at this end of the continuum don't recognize it or reject it reject the idea creative inspiration where does that come from geniuses musical geniuses Mozart acknowledged that what he produced was a gift from God he just cop he saw it in his mind's own copied it
Now, the French psychiatrist Pierre Genet, who worked at the Saltpeter Mental Hospital in Paris in the mid 1800s, focused on the negative. The earlier slide I showed you, the negative slide. He was dealing with psychosis and hysteria. And he asserted that all those who experience dissociation and psychic phenomena are mentally ill. And that's still the view that's taken by psychiatrists today. But Frederick Myers did not discount the positive and arrived at his tertian quid approach and the continuum of human experience. Tertian quid means, no, there's another explanation. A third explanation. And he went out of his way to find it. Now, it was a bit of a revelation to me, I must confess, when I discovered this in my research reading, because I'd never heard of it. Nobody had ever mentioned it to me in, 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 in all my studies. I had to find this out for myself. When I started reading the research of Frederick Myers, Pierre Janet was conducting experiments in our with a woman called Leone. I'll come on to that in a moment. But when I started researching this, I discovered that documented evidence of telepathic hypnosis goes back to the Marquis de Pisigard, 1785, who was a disciple of Franz Mesmer. Now we've all heard of mesmerism, and it's a common misconception that mesmerism is a precursor to hypnosis. They're two totally different things. Mesmer proposed that a person went into a, a trance state through this power, physical animal magnetism, he called it. He didn't know what it was, but he thought it was something physical. But the Marquis de Pisigre noticed when he was practicing animal magnetism that sometimes his patient would arrive at the door already in a trance state and he'd be nowhere near him. He discovered that just thinking about a patient was often sufficient for them to arrive for an appointment already in trance. And he writes, apart from this inconvenience of turning up for an appointment already in trance, there is another one very much to be feared, the risk that some extraneous factor will interfere with the effect produced at a distance if, for example, the effect one produces is somnambulism. One must know very well how susceptible this peaceful state is to being disturbed by the least extraneous circumstance which can then cause truly miserable confusion. You can only imagine it, can't you? <laughs> if you're walking about in sleep, if you're sleepwalking, which is what it is, basically. Now that was 1785. Moving up to 1846, in the search for rational explanations for trance induction by medical science. Medical science needs to understand these things. By the mid-19th century, animal magnetism and the ideas surrounding it had fallen completely out of favour, being replaced with James Braid's concept of hypnosis. Hypnosis, the Greek word for sleep. He used it because a person in a trance looks like they're asleep. Got nothing to do with sleep at all. But suggested that the trance was induced by suggestion and belief and expectation. So in 1846, in a letter to James Bray, Indian Army Surgeon James Esdale, in support of Mesmer's animal magnetism, he writes.
These are really to remind me where I am. <laughs> During the last six years, I've performed upwards of 300 capital operations of every description using magnetism. And many of them of the most terrible nature without inflicting pain on the patients. He was doing this at the same time as Sir John Elliotson, who was chairman of the Royal Society of Medicine in London, was performing operations in London hospitals, the Middlesex Hospital, using magnetism to induce, induce trance in his patients while he performed all manner of surgery without pain. This is before the invention of anaesthetics. Goes on to say, I've also entranced a blind man and made him so sensitive that I could entrance him however employed, eating his dinner, for example, by merely making him the object of my attention for 10 minutes. He would gradually cease to eat, remain stationary a few moments, and then plunge head foremost amongst his rice and curry. Boom. Just thinking about it, no voice and gesture. I frequently desired the visitors of my hospitals to pretend to take the portraits of patients and to engage their attention as much as possible by conversing with them. Then, I retired to another room and reduced them to statues, without the possibility of their even suspecting my intentions. He goes on to say, how such phenomena can be accounted for without presuming the existence of a physical power transmitted from the operator to the...